With the total solar eclipse of April 8th less than two months away, now we've talked in great length about the science behind the eclipse, what causes it, and also who will enjoy totality for the longest. But in this week's edition, we're going to talk a little bit more about the history as opposed to the science, how different cultures explain the eclipse, in particular delving into the history, the mythology, and the folklore surrounding the total solar eclipse, and sort of break down how each culture appropriated the eclipse and tried to explain the science before the scientists understanding was really developed and we really reached that modern level of science. So let's break down some of the information here on the history and the mythology surrounding the total solar eclipse and history buffs out there may find some of this information very, very interesting. Now throughout human history, the prediction of eclipses has been something that is very common. And in fact, many ancient societies, even BC era, were still doing a pretty good job of predicting the eclipse. Essentially, they observed that it occurred in regular intervals and they divided the amount of time between eclipses and extrapolated that information to say, hey, if it happened this long ago, here's what we can expect in the future. So prediction was actually fairly accurate given the lack of scientific understanding, but the cause is something that was still unknown and remained unknown until relatively modern history. Now each society had a very different explanation for the cause of the eclipse. So let's delve into some of the first recorded observation of the total solar eclipse dating well back before Christ 2159 BC all the way to 1948 BC. Those were some of the earliest references in mythology. In particular, Chinese astronomers mentioned the total solar eclipse well into the BC era. They did attempt to predict the eclipse with some degree of accuracy, but of course some of those primitive, very early eclipse predictions not quite as accurate as they became over the years. Now starting in 772 BC, the Chinese cultures actually recorded the eclipses in writing on animal bone, and some of those still survive today, so you can actually look back at those records and see some of the observations that were occurring at that time. Now predicting the eclipse was a goal of many early cultures, including the Babylonians, which also predicted the eclipse as early as 750 BC. So the Chinese were first, but the Babylonians had a little bit more success in predicting the eclipse, and they actually used a formula, and that was based on the observations of when those eclipses occurred. Essentially what they did is they added 18 years and 11 and three quarters days, and they determined, hey, that is when the next total solar eclipse is going to occur. And generally speaking, that formula actually actually fared pretty well. Now, of course, it took many generations of observations with these eclipses being spaced out by so many years. So a lot of this was written history that was passed on from generation to generation of scientists. And then they employed that formula to extrapolate and predict to the future. Now, on the other side of the ocean, there were predictions being made as well. In Mexico and Central America, the Mayans were among the first to mention the total solar eclipse. And not only did they mention it, but they recorded it in books. Only around four of those have survived the test of time, and that is because of Spanish conquistadors that burned many of those books due to the superstitious connotations with the eclipse. Not only did the Mayans observe the eclipse, but they also created a number of different theories, many of which involved superstition and religion surrounding why the eclipse was occurring. Now, with the Spanish conquest, many of those records from Mayan culture were erased with the burning of those books. Several did survive and last into the 21st century, but as a whole, most of the books that were written by Mayans do not survive anymore. Now, they had some very interesting, to say the least, theories on what caused the eclipse. Eating the sun is something that is actually very prevalent in a lot of those early cultures, and they viewed it as more of a religious demon, and they actually performed sacrifices during the time of the eclipse, and they believed that that was necessary to appease the gods and to bring the sun back out. Now, of course, Nowadays, we know that that is not the case, but that myth of eating the sun is something that's actually very commonplace, and each culture has its own version of that. Um, related to what the Mayans saw and also a number of other cultures that we're going to see. So what did they do to appease those gods in their culture? They said that drums and dancing um, would help awaken the sun from its slumber and the loud noises associated with that could actually bring the sun back out. And of course, we know that during our three and a half minutes or so of totality, we are simply going to see that daylight at the end of it and we know exactly when it's going to start and when it's going to finish. Back then, though, they did not know that and they associated making loud noises and dancing 
with getting the sun back out in the sky and the eclipse was viewed as the wrath of the sun god and the eclipses were generally feared by Mayan culture and they viewed the eclipse as something that could come with some detrimental side effects. So they employed those strategies to try to get the sun to return after totality due to the potential consequences, at least what they viewed as the danger of the total solar eclipse. Now, many different cultures have explanations that actually do have some similarity and they really have um, some overlap, even though each one of these stories and each one of these myths is slightly different. As I mentioned, the concept of eating or devouring the sun, uh, that kind of makes sense when you think about it without any scientific um, underpinning that an animal or a god or some other um, deity was eating the sun. That's something that was explained in a number of cultures as one of the earliest origins of what was the cause of the eclipse. Now, many cultures actually employed the same remedy or the same strategy to try to make the eclipse revert back to a normal state, and they used dancing and loud music. As I mentioned with the Mayan culture, that was something that was considered to be the solution to the eclipse. Now, of course, we know now that it is just time, in our case, several minutes that will have totality before the sun comes back out and the darkness ends. And there are variations in different cultures, although all of them do have some degree of overlap and some degree of similarity as well. A number of cultures, as I mentioned, that eating or gobbling up of the sun, that is a fairly common feature in mythology and folklore. In the Hindu mythology, the head of a serpent god named Rahu was actually a planet that wanted to gobble up or consume the sun. And with the sun disappearing, that was one of the earliest explanations that seemed logical at the time. In European folklore, they did have similar um, viewpoints on that. Not only were eclipses viewed as bad signs or bad omens, but also comets, they were viewed as essentially the wrath of the deity. And it was a bad sign generally. If you saw an eclipse in European culture, it did not bode well for the ruler of that country or the nation as a whole. In other words, it was some degree of judgment. Hey, you're not doing a good job leading this country or this nation needs to be punished as a result of some sort of bad behavior. So eclipses and comets were not good signs in many European cultures. Now in Native American cultures, a number of theories do have some overlap and some similarity with regards to the explanation of the total solar eclipse. The Choctaw tribe, um, again, the devouring of the sun was a similarity that they noted, except in their version of the myth, it was a black squirrel that attempted to swallow the sun and their remedy or their solution to that totality of the eclipse was quite similar. They made music and loud noises in an effort to drive away what they viewed as a negative spirit or something that needed to be driven away. Now, in Chinese mythology, I mentioned the Chinese culture was the first to really mention the eclipse, and that dates all the way back to 2000 BC. In their culture, it was a dragon in the sky devouring the sun, and actually a number of um, old works of art and paintings do demonstrate that and show you exactly what they described in their mythology. Now, the Chinese word for the eclipse, actually, if you translate it verbatim, translates to sun eat. So they really viewed that it was the eating or devouring of the sun that was the cause of the total solar eclipse. Now, many palaces and royalty in the Chinese um, culture actually employed individuals to make loud noises with drums, to shoot off firecrackers, and even sometimes shooting the bow and arrow up into the sky in the direction of the eclipse was viewed as one of the solutions or the remedies to the eclipse. So they had those solutions, which is again a similarity to what we talked about in other cultures. In other indigenous American tribes, such as the Cherokee, it was a different animal that happened to be trying to devour the sun. The Cherokee culture thought it was a frog that was trying to swallow the sun. And the earliest references there dated back to the 1700s. So we have some old records on that as well. And very similarly, it was loud music that was to remedy. Now, a lot of cultures really viewed the eclipse as something that was strongly negative, that was detrimental and potentially dangerous. And the effects of the eclipse were not only dangerous because of the potential cause of it, whether it was a deity or a god who is really upset with the culture, but it was especially dangerous to children and expecting women. So oftentimes during these eclipses, folks didn't go outside with you know their eclipse glasses to watch it, even though there were no eclipse glasses. They went inside and they hid from the eclipse because they believed that it was something that was harmful, especially pregnant women. They were viewed as at a vulnerable and at risk to the impacts of the eclipse. So they stayed indoors. They stayed away from the eclipse, and it was not something that was viewed necessarily as a spectacle, but it was viewed something as something that needed to be avoided and needed to be hidden from. So that's the mythology. That's the history. What about the modern scientific understanding of the total solar eclipse? How do we link the old mythology to what we know now about that total solar eclipse? So dating back to the Renaissance period and the medieval time period, that is when the scientific
scientific understanding really started to become a bit more modern. And our history books in the 1600s, that is when we really started to take more scientific observation. There was a researcher, a scientist named Kepler, Johannes Kepler, who thought the glow around the sun during the eclipse was actually the moon's atmosphere. Now, now we know that that is the corona. It's actually a part of the sun, and it is part of the sun's atmosphere. But Kepler thought it was the moon's atmosphere, and that was an erroneous assumption. But it certainly made sense. If you saw a glow around that ball of darkness, could certainly be associated with the moon's atmosphere that he thought was illuminated by the sun. Now, a couple hundred years later, Francis Daly actually realized what we now know, that that part of the glow was actually the sun's atmosphere as opposed to a part of the moon. Certainly interesting how a couple hundred years can shape the evolution of science. Now, it was really in the 1900s that we really started to get a more modern understanding of the eclipse. And part of that is to thank for Albert Einstein. His theory of relativity played a role in our modern understanding of the total solar eclipse. He really understood that light is something that can be deflected or refracted due to the gravitational field of objects. So in other words, the power of gravity, the same force that holds us down to the ground and keeps us secure here at the ground level, gravity could essentially bend light and cause optical illusions. And due to that 1919 total solar eclipse, Albert Einstein became a household name and his research really helped elevate the science to the next level. 1919 is one of the most well documented um, eclipses in modern history and hard to believe in just a matter of 100 years. Now we are about to enjoy another one here in 2024. Now of course the science really started to take off in the 20th century and beyond and now that we are in the 21st century it's all about enjoying the eclipse safely and um, hope you found this history lesson interesting. Of course we've talked a lot about the science, the explanation and who is going to see the total solar eclipse the most. But in the Climate Friday newsletter, we'll have new information each and every week pertinent to both the history and the science and what you can expect on April 8th. Take care.